Hello world, my name is Tim Russwick and we don't have any audio. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, no, we do. We do. We're good. How's everybody doing today? We're on the Devology Livecast. My name is Tim Russwick. I'm with Rick Davidson and Antonio Foster. And today we're going to talk about a very special uh, journey from a very special person and kind of a little bit of how they learned Unity and maybe they ended up working at Unity and a bunch of cool stuff along the way. How's everybody doing before we get into all this Everybody's good. Audio's good. Video's good. You guys can all see us. Audio check. Check one, two. Can you, uh, do we have any echo this week? Antonio, can you, are you echoing? One, two, three. Hi, I don't know. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone see me okay? So professional. Who doesn't, Who doesn't love, love a, a live cast, cast that starts, that starts off, with off with us doing, doing audio, audio check? check. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, like better, better not hearing us. This thing on. <laughs> yeah uh, I've definitely yeah, yeah. done, I mean, we do video courses and stuff, and having your tech set up and tech tests are super important because... If you get all the way through a video and like you have something wrong with your audio or something, oh, oh. echoing, team, team, everyone's, team, everyone's echoing, echoing apparently. apparently. We're echoing. Hold on. Echoing, yeah. echoing, yeah. Look in the chat. chat. Oh, oh. Echoing, echoing. Who's echoing? So Tim so Russell is controlling, controlling the tech. tech. If you want to send, send any, any feedback, feedback about, about today, today <laughs> Tim Russell at, at, at this isn't working.com. Working <laughs> 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 Okay, we're know. gonna we're gonna fix this. Hold on. So is only Rick echoing? Everybody's everybody but me, really. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. So you do so some you do some talking, talking Tim. Tim, and fix the problem. All right. Cool. I got it. I think I got it. How's that, Rick and Antonia? Say hey. Hi. Check one two. Hello. Hello. Still echoing on better. Thank goodness we've got live people watching. <laughs> Now it's just now Rick. it's just Rick. Check one two, no echo for me. Hello. Hello. This is how I actually speak. In yeah, real Rick life. just yeah, Rick just has an echo. He's just in a bathroom. <laughs> Good now. Good now. Is it better? Good. Good now. Fixed. Okay, we did it. Oh, phew. Great. Okay, there we go. Tim, whatever settings, take a screenshot and remember that. <laughs> or else next week you'll be like, hey, everyone, are we echoing? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Idiots. Oh, we're good. This is super high Thanks, tech. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> really helps. Antonio, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. What is a Unity, what's the term? Unity ambassador, advocate, Unity, uh, Evangelist? what's the word? Sorry? Evangelist? Evangelist, that's what I was after. What is a Unity evangelist and how does someone become a Unity evangelist? Well, it's technically not possible anymore. So evangelism is something Unity used to do. It's um, kind of like developer advocate, if you've heard of that title. So you talk to the community, you advocate for them to the organization, you advocate for the tools to the to the devs. Um, so what used to be called evangelism or dev advocacy um, doesn't really exist anymore, um, but that's what my role would have been a couple of years ago. My title now is Senior XR Technical Specialist for Industry. So, oh, um, that's much snappier than yeah, evangelism. Yeah, Way it's better. much easier to remember. Whoever similar. coined, yeah. Um, so good. what an evangelist does is, as I said, similar to a dev advocate. What I do is, is quite a lot like that. Um, so I use Unity's XR tools, so AR and VR, augmented reality and virtual reality, and the space in between, so XR or mixed reality, because the line between those two is blurring more every day as hardware and software develop. Um, I use our tools, I build demos, I help onboard new users. I focus more on industry than in gaming. So I do automotive, transport, manufacture, aerospace, aeronautics, uh, film, media entertainment, pretty much everyone. Uh, anyone that isn't games basically is my focus and help them to kind of get get started using Unity's tools. And then I take their feedback, feed that to Unity and I kind of learn about all the new things and feed that back to uh, potential users. So that's kind of what I do. Awesome. You know, I, I've learned something already because I didn't I, I didn't know that XR was a thing. It's like mm. I, I imagine there were so people like VR. Well, technically we're doing AR. Well, it's not AR, but a, a, a VR. OK, let's just have a thing that covers everything, which is XR. Is that the, exactly? OK, cool. That's yeah. If so in doubt, that's, uh... Just slap an X in there and say X covers it all. Got it. Right. X could be you. Some people call it MR mixed reality. Um, so for those listening oh. who aren't sure of the difference, VR is uh, virtual realities where you're completely immersed in a virtual world where you put on a headset and you can't see the real world at all. Um, augmented realities where you can see the real world, but with digital content on top. So that might be Pokemon Go on your phone. Uh, it could be a face filter on Instagram um, or on Snapchat, or it could be 
something more complex. So if you wear a HoloLens, which is um, a headset with a transparent display, you can see the world and also semi-transparent content on top of it. So you could overlay a model onto the real world. But because that line is blurring, you can use a VR headset and access video footage of the real world with pass-through. You can go from AR all the way into VR and back again using one device. So there's that kind of blend between the two, and that's what XR is quite a useful term to describe. Cool. Makes sense. Oh, awesome. I've always been super fascinated in AR over VR because I think VR is, I can see the applications as like a, a video game type of deal, like getting lost mm. in that. But AR, I feel like, oh my God, you can like help mechanics repair motorcycles. You can, you mm. know, play Pokemon Go on the Santa Monica mm. Pier. All kinds of stuff, right? Like the, it's, it, and maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm just not seeing the applications of it, but I've always seen AR as like the future of technology and VR seems like a cool toy. That's, I, mm. I, I don't know. I think you're right about AR. There's loads of uses. You know, people actually use it for emergency, um, you know, uh, to, to assist with rescue from car accidents because you can scan the QR code inside the door of a car and then see, get color coding on which parts to be careful of when you're helping someone escape using jewels of life. There's just amazing possibilities. You can augment sports games. Um, you know, you could test furniture in your house before you buy it and configure it. But actually, VR has a lot of different use cases, I think. So um, you can create showrooms, you can have whole digital worlds. I'm very interested in the use of VR to improve the real world. So using virtual worlds to make the real world a better place. So a project I did last year is uh, I created the world's first virtual reality LGBTQ VR museum. Uh, because I wanted to go to a museum that centered queer stories and that didn't exist actually in the UK where I'm based. And I don't have the resources to build a physical museum, but I can build a virtual one. So I scanned different, uh, 3D scanned different personal objects belonging to different members of the queer community and recorded their audio stories and created this virtual gallery for them. That's um, awesome. So that's one of many, many uses. But yeah, really, it's anything that you could do in a virtual world, you could create a VR space for. Um, there's there's great possibilities with full body tracking, which I'm really interested in. So uh, I spend time in VR chat and I use a full body tracked avatar. And there's a lot of interesting questions there about avatar embodiment. So I can have an avatar that doesn't present female, for example. Um, and people treat you differently if you're in with an avatar that presents male or doesn't have a gender. Uh, there's also interesting things around gender euphoria and gender dysphoria if you embody a different avatar and kind of look at yourself um so yeah loads and loads of interesting possibilities yeah. all the way from kind of psychology to engineering and everything in between that's usually how it is right like the the what you imagine the possibilities are, are always very limited compared to what the actual possibilities are with any new technology it's hard to imagine For sure, like, yeah. like the internet everybody's like oh we can like uh totally talk between computers yeah, like 40 <laughs> years ago, and it's like, wait a second, my car can notify me when it's unlocked? That's different. <laughs> right, exactly. I think yeah. AR and VR had different, um, you know, you have to choose the right tool for the job. Right. But I think there's really almost endless possibilities with either. And as I said, that space is blurring. They're not as clearly distinct as they used to be, and I think that will continue to blur more and more. That's where XR and has... comes in, right? Mm, exactly that. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say, we've got a lot of folks in our community who are Unity people, actually at the risk of having our chat explode in a sea of nonsense. Maybe folks in the chat now can let us know, are you a Unity or an Unreal or a Godot or a, what's that other Construct 3 Construct that some three, guy I know likes? Where, where, let me see if yeah, my pointing uh, is in the right direction. It's all reversed. <laughs> yeah. So just let us know in the chat if you're a, a Unity or Unreal or something else. No as pressure. As your primary engine. <laughs> and um, just so we know who's hanging out with us, what what has changed in recent times, maybe in, in 2021 or 2022 versions of Unity, uh, in terms of VR, AR, have there been any new bells and whistles added or is it just kind of the same stuff but a bit better? No, lots and lots of new things. Um, so it really depends on which area you work in. As I said, I imagine a lot of people here are going to be on the gaming side of things, and I'm not the best positioned to speak to the gaming tools because that's not really where my focus is. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I've been working on a lot is construction, interestingly. So there's a tool called Visual Live. It's an augmented reality tool for construction. So there's this common problem where if you go onto a construction site, I didn't realize this because I'm not from the construction world, but almost every building that's made something is made differently to the plan so everything goes over budget everything goes over time and it's really hard to 
to discern that from paper plans. You can go onto a site and compare paper plans to a physical build. It's really hard to tell that a pipe has been installed a foot to the left. But if you have an AR headset and you can see a transparent, semi-transparent model of the building onto the real building, it's incredibly easy to see that that pipe should be here and instead it's about a foot to the left. Um, so that's that's been an amazing tool to, to start using. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the huh. things I've been working with over the past year. So there's really lots of different possibilities. Um, there's some fantastic AR authoring tools. Uh, so Mars is an authoring tool by Unity to help people create augmented reality content in easier ways. Um, and that's had some updates recently. So I definitely recommend looking into that if you're interested in augmented reality development. Um, but yeah, there's so many tools, honestly, it like, I think we have 28 different XR tools. So it's, it's a challenge to stay on top of it all. I tend to pick one or two to kind of, uh, focus on at the time. Otherwise I get, you know, even I at unity get kind of overwhelmed with the amount of choice that's out there. <laughs> that's super nice. cool though. Like I, I, applications like that always fascinate mm. me. Like I bought a 3d printer a couple months ago and the fact that I could take some of my game models and just print them out in real life was like whoa like that's yeah so that kind of stuff ar vr all this kind of stuff super excites me you said that you weren't super well versed in the gaming world i would love to talk a little <laughs> bit about your journey and how sure. you kind of got into all this uh because we kind of skipped over that we went straight to mm. the <laughs> vr stuff <laughs> Um, I was Tim. I was panicking after the technology start. We're two minutes in, and, and we're <laughs> echoing. Got and got like, just tell us the yeah, good sorry, stuff. Rick. Like, get straight to the best bit. So I used to work with penguins. There you go. We'll bring it back to like something I everyone can relate penguins. to. I love penguins. So um, yeah, penguins. my background. The start with penguins. Always a winner. Everyone loves penguins. Very very dangerous. Don't let them bite you. They have um, be their beaks are serrated like a knife, like a bread knife. So um, don't pet them. They are not friendly. I like penguins uh, we love less them. now. <laughs> they don't love us. Um, no, they're great. They're friendly. They're just uh, enthusiastic. So I started out in zoology and animal behavior. Um, I went to uni for that, and that's what I have my degree in. Um, and then I moved from scientific research. So I used to be an animal behavior researcher. Um, specifically, I looked at the behavior of colonies of ants. That's my specialty. Um, I moved into science communication. So I worked in zoos, science centers, uh, eventually a planetarium basically taking quite technical information about conservation, zoology, science, and breaking that down into more simple language and communicating with a range of people from PhD students to children. So really kind of a jack of all trades. Um, I yeah worked with different animals and I moved to the science center and I did kind of chemistry shows. So they say never to work with animals or children. Um, I worked with animals, children and chemicals. So it's, uh, you know, I learned to operate well under stress. Um, I started working in a planetarium. It's a 3D planetarium, so 12 meter physical dome. Uh, and it showed kind of 3D content. You wear 3D glasses to watch it. And um, I was quite limited in what we created. We could only create astronomy content because of the software we used. And we got lots of requests about rainforest show, underwater show, and like that would be great, but we don't have any capacity to build that. So I started Googling, what's a 3D creation tool to make anything I want? And I found this thing called Unity. I thought, well, it looks like useful. It's free. I guess I'll learn that. Um, looked for a course, found one on gamedev.tv. Uh, so actually, it was it was the uh, one on Udemy, the kind of complete 3D C-sharp gamer. That was my first introduction to any kind of coding. No background at all. Um, started learning what, that. What an okay. unfortunate way to start your journey, to have to put up with... <laughs> put up with me and Ben being like going on about wow. yeah for anyone who <laughs> sorry for all know. the bad habits that you've not now got nowadays I imagine if yeah. anyone at unity is having a look at what they're like why are you doing it that way that <laughs> doesn't make sense why do you serialize field everything all the time yes. it's because just use public it's much them. easier oh no, no we cannot do that I'll do get that. in trouble from yeah but I do exactly. serialize things unnecessarily instead of kind of grabbing it um programmatically I, I'm just like I'll just you know I'll just expose it in the inspector and they're like you don't have to keep doing that I'm like but that's the way I've learned but yeah, I can I... see it in the inspector yeah okay exactly well, right don't, don't talk about too many things that we do wrong that the <laughs> no, actual no, no. people do differently <laughs> no 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 I mean actually it's a great way to design things because when you're working with an artist they can see everything so it's actually a really friend you know it's kind of my principle is to make things accessible so it's actually a really great way to do things I I still I do do that. That's my preferred way of doing it. Yeah, um, cool. So for anyone who doesn't know, yeah, uh, Rick Davidson presented that course along with Ben Tristam. Uh, so it's quite strange to be speaking with you today, Rick, having that watched is, a lot of videos of you. You have no idea how many people have said that to me when I've met them. It's so strange to be talking to you, Rick. What's wrong with you? 
<laughs> yeah. But I think the lesson here is if you take a Game Dev TV course, you can end up working for Unity. I think that's the takeaway <laughs> yeah. from today. Just just from the that's Game Dev the... TV course. Yeah. Nothing <laughs> no else. You don't need to no. apply yourself. You don't need any <laughs> other education. That's all you need to go from A to B to get any that's job it. in the world. Game Dev TV course with Rick in it. Got it. We've got, got our it. YouTube I'm writing that down. That can be our that can be our <laughs> snippet to represent today's conversation. Oh, yeah, I'm not I'm not legally uh, liable for that am I? But no. Um yeah. I, so well I mean I did I did so I took that course and, and that plus, you know, I built up a profile, I started making contacts, I started going to Unity meetups and, and making um building a network and also I started sharing what I was learning online. That was really beneficial. Um especially LinkedIn and Twitter. Those are my two channels where I shared a lot of my kind of technical portfolio. So after some time that caught people's attention, I built those connections and I ended up getting a job as a full time Unity developer at a company called Ultraleap who specialize in hand tracking and haptics. Um, so if you've heard of leap motion hand tracking, if anyone's interested in that, um, leap motion and ultra haptics combined to become ultra leap, which was where my kind of first ever role was. Uh, and then after that, I got the call from Unity after a few years and uh, applied there and got this role. So yeah, it was actually a pretty streamlined route uh, from zoos into coding. <laughs> it's very wow. unconventional. But uh, yeah, it's been fantastic, and I'm did, I'm completely self-taught, basically. So yeah, I was going to ask, did you have any other programming background? Did you study? You know, have you have you gone off to university and studied programming at all, or is it just online, self-taught yep. courses? Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. That's that's cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks I used for... um I used I used Udemy, and uh, after that, I started using YouTube. Um, so what I found initially using the community on YouTube is that there's loads of amazing teachers out there, but especially in VR and AR, which is what I was most interested in because yeah. I was working in this planetarium and I thought, well, 3D 360 content in a dome, it's got to be kind of similar to VR. Turns out not really, but it kind of kind of worked. Um, yeah. So I went straight into VR and instead of kind of working on 2D and 3D games first. And that world, uh, things change a lot because it's really still kind of an emerging technology, more so AR than VR. Um, so if you use a YouTube tutorial, it doesn't work. It doesn't necessarily mean you've done it wrong. It might just be out of date, even if it's only six months right. or a year old. Uh, and that took me quite a while to learn. I started to think, oh, I'm you know, not cut out for this. So doing a course really, really helped because when I got stuck, I could just you know, clone the whole thing and just carry on from where I was. And then once I got that foundation, then it was much easier to kind of find appropriate content to use Stack Overflow, to use YouTube. Uh, right. And I still search for everything all the time. I know nothing off by heart. Um, I just watch YouTube videos and Google stuff when I get stuck still I've been like a true developer <laughs> yep that's what we all do anyone listening we all do that yeah yeah it's... and and there's a question in chat saying what do you do at unity so I mean we, we you talked a little bit about the role and the title mm -hmm. but you know in the past when we've talked to unity evangelist type people um, it seems like oh that seems really cool you just kind of go around saying unity's rad please use it more <laughs> but I I'm guessing there's a little bit more to it than that. What would yeah. your what what would a day look like? You know, today's exceptional talking to a couple mm. of clowns over video, but <laughs> what's what's a normal day look like for you? Um, really depends on the project I'm doing at the time, but it might be something like creating uh, demos for salespeople to go out and pitch and show what is Unity all about, what does real time 3D mean. Uh, so I might create something for them to show. That's something I've been working on recently. I might be creating onboarding documentation or videos. So if we're creating a new product or we've acquired a product, I might be using it, getting to grips with it, and then creating videos or documents to say, hey, this is how you get started using X tool. Um, I talk to users and the development teams at Unity. So I'll take kind of user feedback and feed that back into Unity. And I'll take Unity's kind of learnings and then put that back into the community. Uh, so again, I have this kind of more focus on industrial users, so engineers and kind of that sort of area. Um, yeah, so it's a combination of coding, uh, building demos, building content, distributing that content, and then communicating both within, uh, like internally and externally. So really various. Also lots of conference talks and things like that. This may be a little bit off topic, but like, how do you interact with users of like construction software? Because like feedback is super important when you're building any kind mm. of software, right? And you have to be kind of in touch with the person who's using it, especially if it's not like you, you don't understand that field. Like, how do you, do you just ask them questions? Is it like a survey type of deal? Do you like talk to them? Like, how do you get the feedback that you need to make the effective 
uh, tools? Yeah, it depends. Um, so we have relationship managers. So uh, we'll have like if people are actively working with Unity already and they are our clients, we have specific people to manage the business relationship with them. And they'll manage, say, you know, five to 10 to 20 different clients, depending on the size. So I'll talk to them and say, oh, you know, across all your you know, um, relationships that you're managing, what do you find in terms of and they'll get a lot of feedback constantly. They're very, very in touch with their different clients. So I'll say, which of you use XR? And uh, what kind of issues do people run into? And what kind of features do they want? And what is really popular and what's less popular? Um, and then, but a lot of it also comes from my own um, use. Like I'll, what's called dog food, the products a lot. Um, dog fooding is a term which means just use your own, like if you were making dog food, eat the dog food to see how it tastes. It sounds weird. I don't really like it. Uh, other people say drink your own champagne, which is maybe a bit nicer. Uh, but does, it says, although drink your own champagne makes me think that you're kind of lost in the jungle and there's only one way to keep yourself <laughs> hydrated, if you know what I mean. So although eat your own dog food. That's kind of equally as Dog food is a pretty like standard you know term, but yeah, it's a weird one. I'm, um, I'm, making, I'm making a note of that in my next course that I teach. That's coming, eat your own dog food. Dog food, yeah, or dog food. So if there's food any, any of our yeah. teaching assistants listening at the moment or joining <laughs> us on this, they're going to be like, Rick, don't do that. There's going to be five years of explaining what on earth eat your own dog food means. <laughs> Well, it's actually an abstract reference that originally was coined by Antonio. <laughs> no, it was not coined by me. I'm not claiming that. Uh, but if you, you know, if you produce tools for people, if you uh, are a chef and you're producing food, it's good to kind of, you know, taste it to see yeah. how it is. So um, exactly. that's kind of, you know, I, I use Unity's tools a lot because I'm creating demos and things like that. So a lot of things, you know, I'll find out like, oh, you know, this thing doesn't, X thing doesn't work with Y thing. Maybe that would be useful. So I'll feed that back immediately. Um, so yeah, you discover a lot by using, just like how if you were making a game, you'd kind of play your own game and go, ah, right. oh, like this is really difficult. Like, mm, should probably change that. Or that mechanic's not really fun. Or this mechanic's really fun. Like maybe I should just make the game about that. Uh, so yeah. yeah, just testing your own things is is really helpful. You know, and our, our chat is very excited. As soon as you mention dog in any of our conversations, <laughs> people are like, ooh, because for now we've had, I think it's been months and months, we've had our game idea, which is draggy dog. And it's all about playing as a dog that's dragging itself around, you know, when dogs have worms and they drag themselves <laughs> around. And it's hilarious. I love this. Although now that we're now that we're doing this in YouTube, we don't, people can't be putting in GIFs of that. Normally you just oh. mention the word draggy dog and there's, you know, it's the <laughs> golden retriever. It's the classic one. So... Ah, Tim, this is an imperfect solution. We can't. The I'm hilarity is dropped. I'm going to Slack after this, and I want to see all the draggy dog gifts. So everyone better <laughs> yeah. get them ready, and I'll join, we and are, I want to see them all. We have a Game Dev TV game jam coming up, and I don't know, I'm really close to convincing a certain Tim Ruswick to make it a <laughs> draggy dog theme. Everyone has to I make a game about... we might ban draggy dogs. We might do that. No. Avocado oh, Fire says it's my idea. That is <laughs> not my idea. That is such a Rick idea. It has Rick all over it. I love it. I'm going to make this. We can, uh, maybe Unity can come and uh, encourage in some VR. Dog. Oh my goodness. You yeah, in VR. Oh, my AR. You could see the yeah. draggy dog in your own home. Oh, no. I know. What if we did? Yeah, and That's you have to, with the controllers, you have to move by <laughs> waving them around like that. It's going to be so good. You could like tap on the screen to drop like, you know, treats to lead the draggy dog to like collect. You, you were so food. close to saying something that was going to get us banned from the internet then. <laughs> <laughs> tap on the screen as the dog to drop, not what to you're thinking. No. <laughs> I was thinking treats. I don't know what you're, you're thinking. You're thinking front of funnel as opposed to back of funnel. Yes, okay, exactly. that's where my brain went. <laughs> Top of funnel development. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, we've got it. For anyone listening, any of our regulars listening is like, I really hope they talk about draggy dog today. <laughs> there we go. We've talked about it. <laughs> one, day, way now. one day. One day Tim so will let I you make that, that game. Yeah. <laughs> you can, here's the, here's the secret tip for everyone. You don't need Rick's permission. You can just go make the game. <laughs> I, hey, I've been encouraged. Sorry <laughs> about, about that. We've had a couple. There's been a couple of prototypes, early games out there, I think, that have, have potential. Amazing. But one day. yeah. So it's I in... really want to see a VR or AR Draggy Dog game. Oh, so I'd you've heard that. it. Everyone's heard it first here that Unity will sponsor a special uh, development grant for anyone who works <laughs> on a a suitably high quality I might, VR. I might be able to get some swag, like a sticker. I might be able to get a sticker. <laughs> like, sticker. I, I don't know. <laughs> At least I promise mug. nothing more. Do you I'm guys have probably... Unity mugs? How can we get a Unity mug? No, that would I'd have... happily on our live cast have a Unity mug. Send us send us any swag you want. We'll I can use... probably I can probably get you hooked up. I'm looking around for Unity swag now. I have like a t-shirt. I have a laptop bag. I don't have a you mug. You don't have though. to give me your stuff though. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I don't mind. Yeah. 
How about that microphone? Just send that microphone over. <laughs> yeah, that means you to teach it. Give me that. Anyway, <laughs> you're the you're the seriously you're the best kind of guest and the worst kind of guest. The best kind because you're laughing at all my nonsense, which makes me so happy. But then the worst kind because you're laughing at all my nonsense, which makes more nonsense come out of my mouth. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you for being so awesome. It's so good to have you here. Oh, Normally, yeah, I've got this right. grumpy old man who's kind of like, mm, stop being stupid. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of AR what, and Tim? VR. There's no way to speak and... about Tim, is it? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> He's neither grumpy nor old. So. My whole job is just to keep Rick on track. Like, that's literally what our live casts are, is like, Rick, we talked about this, the five things you need in yeah. game dev. Come on. <laughs> Slap the wrist. Um, yeah. Okay, so how would, how would you say, so you had a weird kind of journey. You've changed careers mm -hmm. a couple of times. You went through all kinds of ups and downs and you started with Rick's course and then you're doing AR and VR and now you work for Unity and stuff. But if somebody else wanted to get into XR or VR or any of that stuff, is there a different path you'd recommend? Or like where would you have somebody start like today if they wanted to kind of look into this That's stuff? a great question. So Unity actually has accreditations. So you can take kind of Unity qualification and become kind of a Unity accredited developer. So that's, that's one route. Um, I would say having a portfolio is super important that worked really well for me because people tend to kind of a lot of it tends to be who you know unfortunately just getting any job really helps if you know the right people and things like that so um i didn't really have any contacts in the industry so i built that network by having a portfolio and then sharing it on social media and i think that really did wonders for me yeah. um because the proof is kind of in the pudding right and later you know people will as part of my interview, for example, I had to do a coding test and people will go through your code. But the proof is in the pudding in as much as if you're sharing a portfolio, people can see that you've created a game, you've created VR content, you've created AR content. And particularly VR and AR, they are these emerging technologies. Most people who work in the area don't specifically have a degree in VR or AR. They might have a computer science degree. A surprising number of people are just self-taught. Um, I'd say having a degree in a STEM subject is useful. So I do have a degree in biology and I think that was helpful just because of the sort of barriers to entry, I suppose. Um, not that I necessarily use it in my day job, uh, but yeah, I would say build up a portfolio, um, get experience. My challenge was actually getting hold of devices. So for a long time, all I developed for was one VR headset that I had kind of saved up with my kind of meager savings and um, my mobile phone. And that was it. That was all I had access to. Uh, and then after that, things got easier. I got into tech and I had access to loads of mixed reality devices, which was fantastic. Uh, but if you know anyone with different devices, so uh, a Quest 2 is pretty affordable. And um, I would recommend developing on a, a Quest 2. I started with a, a Rift S, which is also an Oculus headset. Um, but either are quite easy to develop for. And I think the Rift S is uh, deprecated now. I don't think it's being produced anymore. So Quest 2 is about £400. So it's, or maybe 300 now. It's fairly expensive, um, but if you have some VR experience and some AR experience, like on a smartphone or a tablet, is completely fine. Um, that's that's a great in. So I'd say get hold of any device you can and uh, build up a portfolio and share that as widely as you can. Start building that network. So you can, yeah, because I've seen some of those. Like for fifteen bucks, you could buy like one of those headsets that you just put your phone in and you can mm. kind of use that. They don't work very well, but they work yeah. enough to maybe get something running. It's actually really, really tough to develop for those because it is a mobile device. Uh, right. And so VR content on that is, it's pretty challenging. I'd say with the Quest 2, although it's technically a mobile device, um, there, there's a pretty standard pipeline for developing for it. So it's not as tough. Okay. If you kind of had a kind of phone that you slot into a head mounted display, that can be quite challenging to develop at least VR content for. Um, but AR content where you're sort of pointing your phone and uh, you know seeing something on your screen, like kind of Pokemon Go style, um, that's a, also a fairly established pipeline. I will say though, if you develop for an iPhone or an iPad, you actually need a Mac to do that. It's very yeah. challenging to do it without a Mac. That's just because of an Apple walled garden kind of situation. Uh, if you have an Android phone, <laughs> You should be able to just develop for it no matter um, what you're using anybody wondering i did find a workaround for that you can rent a mac Ooh. in the cloud which is what i ended up doing so you can That's just like rent one, i think it was like 30 bucks or something and you get like 20 hours and then you can just take your code and put in x code and do all the the cool fancy tim i wish stuff. i had known this because i ordered <laughs> mac <laughs> I was about to, and I'm like, this, this can't be the only way. I this, rarely develop no for iOS, so yeah, this yeah. is good to know for me. Thanks. Every day's a school day. 
Yeah, it was <laughs> it was a good uh, learning for me because mm. I hated iOS development. <laughs> I wanted, and Android was so easy, and then iOS is like so yeah. complicated. I'd say for beginners, like personally, <laughs> I like developing for Android devices when I do mobile yeah. deployment. At least you get used to it, and then like iOS is like where you mm. take it seriously and you can make some money on it. But Android is just even the store like it's just you can be instantly there instead of waiting seven to ten days or whatever it is i've never actually published any apps to an app store so that i haven't got experience in yet but um i will turn to you when (laughs) when the day comes yeah um okay cool so so you would actually recommend a lower end vr device not unless you're doing ar with the phone uh, yes if you're doing vr personally okay yeah and it's about the price of a game console kickstarter devices yeah, it's about okay. three. I think it's about three hundred to four hundred GBP, or maybe three hundred to four hundred dollars. You'll have to look it up. But I, to my knowledge, the the Quest Two is the cheapest VR headset that's kind of easy to develop for. Um, you'll need a cable to plug it into your laptop or PC. Um, with tethered VR, so there's there's kind of this choice between VR that is attached, so tethered VR attached with a cable to your computer, or untethered, where it's like essentially a mobile device. There's no cables. Pros and cons for each. Um, When you're developing for tethered VR, it can be much more graphically kind of impressive, I suppose, because the PC is powering it. So you don't have to optimize things as much. It's kind of easier in that regard. Um, PC's powering and typing video to the headset? Okay. Yeah, exactly that. So you you have all the power and kind of brain of the PC there. So you don't need to kind of make everything super optimized. Whereas a standalone VR headset with no cable, it's onboarded, the the PC's in the device. So you think of it as a mobile device, quite a powerful mobile device, but you don't want to try and make, you know, the world's most graphically complex game and then put it on a quest because it will just like overheat and start lagging and it won't be very comfortable. Um, So pros and cons, you know, the untethered one, you can wander around more, Uh, but it's not, it's not a huge restriction. It depends what kind of game you're trying to make. But I think when you get started, actually untethered is quite nice. You can walk around, you know, um, yeah, it's so it depends on your personal preference, really. Cool. Uh, I think we have a lot of developers. So like a lot of the people in the chat right now are people that have taken game dev TV courses, but that's kind of their whole skill set is like maybe 50 to 80 percent of a course. So Mm -hmm. um, is there you said there's some resources on Unity. Is there anything specific you can talk about to kind of get started there? Yeah, that's a good question. So Unity Learn is where I would go. Unity Learn is kind of all of Unity's uh, courses that we've created and you can filter by kind of expertise level. So kind of absolute beginner, beginner, medium expert. Uh, You can filter by the type of content you want to make. Um, I would say when you're new to it, look at kind of the more holistic courses. So Unity Learn has these sort of bite size in between, you know, you're trying to build X, you're trying to build Y, this is the bridge between them. Uh, or it has these big courses for like, you've started at square zero, you want to get to, and they're more like kind of, if you're used to game dev TV courses, they're more like that. So look for the kind of longer duration courses on Unity Learn. They're very helpful, especially um, kind of, they really span the breach actually from from beginner to expert. Um, and I think, what, to be honest, once you're kind of 50 to 80% of the way through, um, I'll be honest, I didn't finish my game dev course because I got a job before I finished it. So <laughs> I got about 80% of the way through. I was like, okay, I'm, now I'm doing it every day professionally. Um, and at that point, I just kind of started using YouTube tutorials and making my own right. things. Because once you know how to find that information well enough and you understand the fundamentals, right. you know, you don't need to do a whole course. You just need to find <laughs> the pieces you want to p- place them together to build what you're you have to, to know what you don't know right like when you're completely mm. starting out you don't even know what to yes. search youtube for so course yes. is super helpful in getting you started and kickstarting it but once you know all the terms and like oh i just mm. need to get this model in this space you can google that exact problem and yes. um and find solutions to it um, although always if you're looking in unity add the word unity because the number of times i search something like <laughs> how to destroy child without removing parent like oh <laughs> unity like unity i'm on a list i'm sure like, FBI so might careful show you yeah because yeah it happens to me <laughs> i yeah. think the unity docs are amazing as well whenever mm. i'm i'm playing around because often it's like how what's what's that particular method i'm looking for or mm. i've I've forgotten the syntax. Unity Docs is great, I think, for that. So much better than stinky Unreal Docs. <laughs> or Godot. I would say Unreal are my friends. I will not say a bad word against them. But I will say, yeah, the Unity Docs um, I find incredibly useful. Also, if you're using a device, um, you might find documentation for that. So, for example, um, I used to work at Ultraleap. They have a kind of uh, leap motion hand tracking device. And their own docs for their own device talk about how to use it with Unity. 
So if you're using any proprietary kind of gadget or device, input device, they'll usually have Unity documentation themselves on their own website about how to get started, how to get the data into Unity, and from there, do whatever you want with it. So that's a consideration if you're kind of a VR, AR, or other input device type developer. Cool. What, uh, aside from aside from games, what and and uh, you've talked a little bit about construction and a few other things. Where do you see if someone is learning the skill set of Unity and C Sharp and you know how to make things work together? What are the career paths? We we only ever talk about mm. games. That's what we're up to here. But our fundamental premise is that we're teaching people skills by making games. So you don't necessarily then have to say, I'm going to go make games. And I think it's one of those things as well. Maybe after you've spent a decade making games or in the games industry or around games, you, you kind of get a little bit curious and say, you know, even, or even if you've been doing this for six months, what else could I do? And what other opportunities, particularly from a career work, making money standpoint, what other paths do you see people go down and have successful careers and, you know, make some of the monies? Yeah, I mean, the visibility I have is going to be quite biased towards VR and AR, obviously, because that's sure. just what I work with. Um, yep. But I see clients in almost every industry using VR and AR in ways that I hadn't imagined. So um, there are BIM professionals. So BIM is a building information modeling data. So that's a kind of architecture and construction area. And I see them using VR, for example, to mock up a building before they built it so they can walk their clients yeah. around it. Um, I see people using AR to maybe peer inside a wall so that they can fix pipes uh, and know where they are because they've scanned it ahead of time. Um, but there's really, it's endless I, that, you know, uh, Tim mentioned earlier, uh, sorry, uh, the, what was it you called? Um, I've had a right. Draggy bike. dog. I think no, the, no, that's that not what I was the, going for. Um, it's hard to hard to forget, but an engineer fixing a machine. That was what you mentioned. Right. So, and I wanted to go back to that because that's an that's an example I've seen as well. So, using AR to kind of activate an overlay on a machine so that you know how to fix right. it. So, I've seen um, machine operations and maintenance done with AR. Um, so, I find that nearly every industrial client that I speak to has, I mean, maybe sample bias here, has, uh, you know at least a few XR specialists using that to benefit the organization. Um, but also once you learn Unity and C Sharp, C Sharp is a language and like yeah. any language, it unlocks a load of possibilities. If you learn to speak Spanish, you get any job in which that's relevant. Um, so C Sharp is fantastic for Unity, um, but if you want to do things like machine learning, then adding in Python allows you to unlock a lot of that. Um, that's I'd say would say is one of the most popular languages for data manipulation and, uh, and machine learning and AI, um, which, you know, big data is a huge area of work and is used in, uh, again, a, a whole range of industries. Um, I've seen people using Unity for molecular modeling uh, and predictive chemistry. Um, yeah, there's just there's just almost any area you want to work in. In fact, you know, my, my background's in zoology and I've now seen zoos using VR and AR to make interactive exhibits. So whatever mm -hmm. your current skill set is, you can almost certainly combine that with uh, programming, whether that's Unity or C Sharp or a different language like, well, any language really that you're interested in. There's almost certainly a way to combine uh, your kind of career history or your passion, even if it's not your career yet, with coding. I worked on a project last year, which was helping artists to create um, interactive XR digital artwork um, to sell. So That's artists awesome. are also using XR. So yeah, there's really no limit. During the whole lockdown thing, I saw a uh, game dev conference that was basically a, a video game. They had modeled like the whole conference halls and stuff like that. And they made, they built the whole thing in VR and mm -hmm. they had like actual games, like create their 3d displays and stuff. And they could do like weird animation stuff with their booths because it was all like 3D. It was it was really cool to see that. And I think that came out of like the whole, we can't meet in person, so let's make something mm. uh, visual. I spoke at a conference called Metaverse Next, um, which was run by Lethbridge College. I spoke along Microsoft and Ubisoft, um, and we had a panel in VR uh, in Altspace, I think, if I remember rightly. So we went into there and we were sat on our panel chatting and we could see the audience kind of waving and sending emojis to us and interacting. Um, so yeah, the pandemic's been kind of really amazing actually for VR spaces. Um, again, I mentioned full body tracking earlier. One thing I found was meditation classes and dance classes in VR and even partner dancing and ballroom dancing oh, wow. using full body tracking, which is really, really cool. So um, yeah, the pandemic's been kind of 
a good I mean I think there's many good reasons to want to go into VR spaces but particularly it allowed people to do things that weren't otherwise physically possible during the pandemic yeah. so it's been really interesting and the whole world has this this digital infrastructure now that it didn't have before right mm. like so many employers are like they experience work from home for the first time where they never would have otherwise mm. and there a lot of them are not going back right because productivity is the same and the costs are down yeah. so why would they and so i think with all of that it i i, I don't think it was the catalyst because vr has been around for a while like i remember headsets mm. were at gdc in 2016 um mm. and that was you know um they were working fine then but like it definitely has kind of lit a fire under the whole um space and and made it kind of accelerate which is fascinating because i think we've we've definitely got more questions about vr and xr stuff um the last year or so uh mm. for game tv students and stuff and we're always trying to figure out what they want to learn next and how to mm. how to help them the most yeah the xr space in terms of jobs is is exploding like when i got into it i don't know the stats now but i think the year i got into it it the number of jobs went up 1500 percent in a year wow. so it's there's so many more jobs than there are people who have the skills it's really really immensely hireable as a skill set um and yeah as you said tim a lot of the roles are remote as well um i'm fully remote so i could in theory live wherever i want um and i can do my job remotely I d it does involve a degree of travel when things are kind of allow um, but in the pandemic, obviously that wasn't super relevant. So yeah, a lot of roles will be remote. That, that's so exciting as well. I know because a lot of my career, I've been advising people on, on how to get a job in the games industry. And for the longest time, I would, I'd have this heartbreaking conversation where people would be living in a country that didn't have a lot of opportunities. And they'd say, cool, I want to go move to, you know, to the UK or US or Canada or Australia you know, somewhere English speaking, and that's, you know, they're the four kind of major countries I'm interested in. How do I do it? It's like, well, you don't have any experience, so you just, you're not going to be able to. It's just not going to be possible because to get a visa, you need mm -hmm. to have a certain level of experience and a certain uh, d degree of skill that the company can say, we can only find this person from overseas. So I'm sorry, but you've just, you know, spend the next three years trying to get good at whatever you're doing because mm -hmm you've got to aim for a medium to senior position. But nowadays with everything being distributed, people able to work within a team online from wherever, I think the opportunities for folks who are living in those countries is just, it's so great now. There's never been a better time for people to get an opportunity to get a job. So that's yeah. really exciting. And then if you add the dimension of perhaps having VR AR, I guess, VR type conversations with your team, if mm. that makes everyone feel more connected and to be able to see each other, then that really means the uh, this worldwide distributed organization is just is just growing. Yeah, definitely. I've seen really great XR content. I, I think um, a lot of companies have legal complications around they have to have an office in that country. So mm -hmm. big companies will often um, be kind of more, they'll be very selective, but not um, they'll be able to select from a huge number of countries um so yeah you still there's still an element of going for a senior role you will have more choice and just that's kind of i think how things yeah. are in any industry as well um but yeah certainly the ability to work remotely and that that's not just for xr jobs obviously it's any kind of software developer role now there's an infrastructure to allow people and not just software developers almost anyone who can work from home has been working from home for you know a good number of years now um but yeah certainly software developer roles i think a lot of companies are open to staying remote because they've seen that productivity is still great and you know you don't always need an office and you can access developers all over the world which is fantastic you get this huge range of experience and cultural diversity and that brings new insights and innovations there's loads of benefits to that as well um so it's yeah it's great to be in an organization where that's really visible and, and that's happening mm -hmm. um and yeah, I think that there are so many more opportunities than there were, just because I think what is particularly noticeable in the XR space is, is how much it's growing. I constantly am seeing more roles and more companies and more startups and more products and the hardware's moving and the uh, software's moving at such a pace. So that presents its own challenges. You have mm. to always be interested in learning because if I ever stop learning for a week, things are you know out of date. Um, yeah. or certainly a year. If I learn a process a year ago, it's probably not gonna be the same process now. So I kind of always come to it as a novice in a way, but I like that. I think it's a great equalizer. Uh, when I was a very, mm. very new dev, I worked with someone who had two years experience 
And he said, honestly, it doesn't really matter because any experience that's longer than a year or two, it's irrelevant anyway. So in XR, we're kind of all equal. Like we all just Google for the latest information because it's just going to change anyway. So I love that about XR. I think it makes it really accessible in a way, but you have to have that want to learn constantly because right. it doesn't really ever stop. <laughs> so a, a question from Pete Morgan, one of our regulars, uh, when will when will be Rick and Antonia's Game Dev TV course on Unity XR? <laughs> That's a, yeah, great question. We'll have to talk about that offline, Rick. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Are you allowed to do that? Does Is Unity like, yeah, go off and make courses wherever? Or are they like, no, Unity Learn is where it's at? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to find out. Depends. Uh, we Things shuffle around a lot and decisions change a lot. It's a big organization. In fact, it's growing super fast. When I joined, I think it was... 2,000 people. Now I think we're over 5,000 people. Wow. Um, and we we kind of acquire really exciting solutions as well. So Weta is part of Unity. Um, Ziva is part of Unity. Uh, so Weta, for anyone who doesn't know, did the VFX for Lord of the Rings. So, um, you know, wow. we could. We're, I'm expecting to see in the next six months, few years. I have no idea about the timeline. Don't quote me on any of this. Um, at yep. some point, more kind of virtual production tools being made available to the users and things like that, which is cool. Is uh, but yeah, so things change. So I don't know, Rick. Sorry. Is Unity heavy into the kind of um, video, VFX space and stuff? Because I know Unreal has a ton of like VFX stuff. Like they did Spider-Man and Iron Man and a bunch of like all kinds of like super stuff. Is Unity has a big uh, chunk of that. I think it's stuff, part it's it. part of what we do. Yeah. So with certainly with Zeev and Weta, that's like obviously the goal there. But um I I'm not privy to the kind of like CEO boardroom strategy meetings. So I'm not sure what our kind of focus is. Well, Mine what have in... we got you on here for, Antonio? <laughs> that's the only Sorry. reason you're here. You're I, to call the CEO. I thought yeah, you were the... <laughs> I'll ping him on Slack and see what he says. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a uh, yeah. So that's certainly something that that Unity does and does well. Um, but I think what we want to do is not pigeonhole ourselves into one area. So for example, right. gaming. You know, we love our gaming yeah. community. Almost like half the organization is dedicated to the gaming community, or maybe more. I don't know the exact numbers, but um, you know, it's not my focus. But a huge, huge, huge number of people at Unity are focused just on the gaming community because that's where we've come from. That's our origin. That's our heart and our soul. Um, but we also essentially the industry side came from the fact that we saw people were using the tools for that. And we were like, ah, oh, didn't think of that. It's actually really helpful for people in automotive engineering, civil engineering, um, manufacturing, transport, you right. know, aerospace, things we'd never really thought about. So that was a relatively newer part of Unity. But once we realized that, we realized that actually some of the tools work better for them and some less well, and we could make this much better for those users. Um, so that's where we kind of started moving into. And so part of that is film, media, entertainment. Um, part of that is, I guess, construction architecture. Part of that is engineering. Um, so yeah, I think we're kind of in all those spaces and growing kind of organically, I suppose, um, because there are new uses emerging that every day that I wouldn't have even thought of that people use Unity for. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. Like, let us help you. Whatever you're building, let us help you build it. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's something I really love about working with Unity is I get to span all these different industries and use cases, which is really cool. Right. That's cool you guys I'm really, get on top of it too. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the Unity business model. I mean, we're, we're so, <laughs> so, so fortunate that we can just use Unity for free, right? It's just mm. spectacularly amazing. Unity, Unreal, Blender, it's just, whew, mm. you know, hey, Adobe, wouldn't that be nice? But um, <laughs> it's it's just, we're so fortunate. And and I understand with games, you know, if you make a product, once you get to a certain amount, then Unity starts to take a percentage of that. How does that work in other industries? If we're spending millions of dollars developing our particular uh, tools and solution and representations in the building industry, we're not then monetizing that. We're using that internally. So is that a case of Unity saying, well, okay, fine, you know, you guys can just use it however you like? Or is there, and maybe this is not in your area of, of knowledge, but I'm just fascinated as a business person, how does Unity make money on things where people are just using it internally and not selling it and there's no kind of revenue stream to track? Well, when people build stuff internally, they often are selling their own services. So even if they're building it for themselves, uh, so say it's um, an AR visualization tool, they'll sell that either, either you know, people, people can use Unity to make tools and sell them for a start. Yeah. So we don't build all of the tools in industry. We sell Unity and people will use Unity to make a tool and then they themselves will sell that and that'll be their business, which oh. is amazing. So that's okay, part of yeah. it. 
Um, part of it will be that enterprise customers will pay for solutions. So we do kind of have enterprise licenses for things and those, mm. you know, are a paid model. Um, and then also part of it is consulting services. So Unity have a solutions team. Um, if people are using Unity tools, they'll pay Unity for support to say, you know, we okay. want your engineers working on this with us directly. Fantastic. So yeah. we can do that. Um, right. Uh, I think I was going to touch on one more, but I've gone mind blank on it. Oh, we also have operate solutions. So Unity has kind of back end things like, you know, analytics, or operational services, cloud hosting, cloud building, um, version control. We have our own version control. So we have all those kind of services that also uh, clients may pay for access to. So there's a bunch of different ways. Uh, it's quite a diverse it. model. But yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. We've got a question from Terrell Turner that asks, Antonia, what were the coding tests like when you were interviewing? I've had intense coding assessments that were pretty involved with algorithms and other data science problems. I'm just curious. Yeah. About that. Yeah. So mine was trigonometry, which was weird because it was <laughs> really relevant to the job uh, in the end. Um, not it might not have been actually that's not completely fair. So I actually interviewed for a different role to the one I ended up getting. Um, that's actually true for both the times I've interviewed. So mm -hmm. in my first role, I interviewed for a very senior role and I ended up getting a slightly different one, but you know, slightly less senior than I was going for, but still really great. Um, at Unity, I was originally approached about IT support. And I said, well, that's not really what I want to do, but I see you have this other role and I think I'd be really good at that. So can you put me forward for that, please? And they're like, okay, sure. And then I ended up getting that job. So be bold <laughs> and do ask those questions. Um, yeah, the code tests I faced um, have been yeah, really varied. They can involve algorithms, leak code problems. Um, if you're someone who's doing tech interviews, I would definitely Google leak code problems uh, or coding kind of patterns and algorithms. L-E-E-T? L-E-E-T. Okay. Yeah, that sort okay. of thing. Uh, those kind of code solutions are things you will be asked. They're really useful for interviews. They're not as useful after the interview, but they're very <laughs> useful for interviews. Uh, I had a trigonometry whiteboarding problem. But the thing that they were looking for, for me at least, was not even that I knew the specific mathematical solution. It was that I could break a big problem into smaller problems because that is a very, very relevant skill set. That is all coding is really yeah. is kind of being able to Google and being able to break one big problem into little chunks and then solve each right. of those chunks. So that's what they wanted. I thought out loud and I said, okay, well, I know this piece so I can kind of figure out this piece and I can use my A-level maths that I vaguely remember to figure out this piece. And they said, well, and also the fact that I enjoyed it. So afterwards, I couldn't actually get to the answer. And they said, did you enjoy it? I was like, yeah, I love solving puzzles. That's what I love doing the most. And they were like, great. That's what we want. So you didn't so, actually great... solve the problem, but no. you passed the interview test. <laughs> but I passed cool, the test. Though. That's, yeah. That's great. a great interview tip right there. It's like you yeah. don't actually need to know how to do things. Just do it with a smile and you get the job, yeah. which is not which always, is so true. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it helps, everything you, know? you do. Don't worry about taking game dev TV courses. Just like turn up, <laughs> like have a, have a couple of drinks and turn up like, woo. <laughs> I'm like, well, this is terrible advice. On the other end of that, though, some people get super anxious and they'll like get flustered that they don't know anything about yes. it. And then they'll shut down and they'll be like, they'll mm -hmm. turn, you know, they might turn around for help and say, hey, mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. And like that, in that moment, that could be probably the wrong thing to do, right? Because even if you don't know the solution, like it doesn't seem like they want you to memorize the solutions to problems because problems are random and they change all the time. They want you to have the ability to solve problems that you've never seen before, even if it includes Google, right? Because that's how yeah. most developers do things anyway. Like without Stack Overflow, I wouldn't know how to program anything. So, but the funny like, thing is, there are interviews where you know they'll say, you know, code this without Google. And it's like I can't do anything without. Right. I, like, I, <laughs> yeah. I can tell you how I would Google it. I can tell you the individual pieces that I would right, solve the for. Strings but I the... can't do it without an internet connection at all. It's not. I have almost so. Um, full disclosure, I actually have ADHD and I have almost no executive functional memory. So I really cannot remember how to code anything, but I will be able to Google for it. And also I keep my own documents. So I'm right. a fiend for documentation because I write down everything and I check my own documentation. Um, yeah. And when people use the term 10x developer, what I often find is that's just a developer that's done it 10 times before and they just grab their old code and yeah, change right. it a bit and put it into their new thing. So once you've built something once, you don't have to build it again. Obviously, this doesn't count if you do it for one employer and move to a new employer. Don't do that. But um, you know, if you remember the code pattern, if you remember how you've done it, or you've documented how you did something, broadly speaking, you can reuse those parts and just chuck them together in a different way. Yeah. Uh, but it is surprising. There are actually employers, quite a few, who will do these kind of tech interviews. They'll expect it to be from memory. Um, sometimes they are looking for the right answer. I don't like that approach at all, actually, because I think it disproportionately yeah 
hinders people, especially from marginalized backgrounds who are socialized to downplay their knowledge, to socialize to, so women are disproportionately likely to feel they don't belong. Uh, anyone who doesn't see themselves represented, people from right. uh, who are BIPOC or ethnic minorities, people who are queer. Um, and so that is a kind of problematic attitude. But I think companies are seeing that and uh, moving into different models. So I know a lot of companies will do take home tests. Um, my one, actually, my coding test was uh, remote. So I did it from home and uh, this was for my my old employer pre unity. And then uh, they gave me, I think it was three hours to basically code a solution with Google, with everything. So I did my best. And then in the interview, they opened it up and said, OK, so why did you do it this way? Why did you do it that way? And I said, well, yeah. I tried this. But in retrospect, you know, having looked at it a day later, I probably would have done it this way. But at the time, I just thought this would be good. So I did that. And they were like, makes sense. That's a logical approach yeah. the way you've suggested on retro in. And so don't be afraid, you know, if you have that kind of. Yeah that type of test don't be afraid to say you know in retrospect now i'd probably do it differently but i started out doing because they, they liked that because that's the way they would have done it probably wouldn't have serialized 37 variables <laughs> at the top of my script <laughs> yeah i blame rick davidson he exactly. uh, taught me to serialize all the fields and uh, you know i still do that and uh you know populate them using the inspector because it's handy it's useful if you're working with artists they can see it so it's a perfectly valid way to do things um yes. better than making everything public don't do that so, you said perfectly yeah. valid, though, and I think that's something a lot of people get tripped up on is they think there's a right answer, right? Yes. You've got a problem. You've mm. got to find the answer. But the answer mm. is very – there's all kinds of spectrums and shades of gray and multiple ways mm. to do everything. And there's 10,000 solutions to that problem, right? And uh, For sure. people get lost in trying to find the solution when they just need to find yes. a solution. Yeah, especially because historically, you know, making something computationally efficient would have been really important. Now right. it really doesn't matter. Like, yeah. don't, you know, in a Unity game, don't call something every frame. Don't put something in an update that's like checking your scene for something because that will. But if you do it once at start, it doesn't matter if it's not right. the most efficient thing in the world. Computers are very powerful nowadays. It doesn't have to be often actually your time as a developer. It's probably worth more than the extra cycle <laughs> on the CPU or GPU. So it doesn't have to be the best solution. I've seen like really terrible solutions sometimes not a unity i will say but um you know in and i've built stuff especially when it's at a hackathon i've got three days and i'm just building something for fun it's not going to be yeah. the best code ever right. and I, the, my one of my favorite memes is um kind of a captain jack sparrow meme and someone says well this is the worst code that i've ever seen run he says but it does run and that's, <laughs> exactly. that's my attitude well you know it got me to where i wanted to go it's fine for now obviously on a professional capacity that's not necessarily the attitude you, you want to take yeah, but, but there's a difference what, between perfectionism and <laughs> yeah you know sometimes that's what you're gonna do right nobody like, wants to talk about it everybody wants to pretend like oh they architected mm -hmm. their code from scratch mm -hmm. but let me tell you i had a trello board full of like 37 million things and i shipped a steam game with 37 million things still on the trello board <laughs> <laughs> and nobody ever yeah. noticed so yeah. you've got to think about like, what's the impact here? How many people are using it? You know, yeah. am I going to have to come back to this in exactly. five years or, you know, a year? Yeah. Because it's probably you that will have to do that. And you'll probably look at it yeah. and go, what idiot wrote that? Oh, it's me. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. like make things easy for yourself or the future person. Uh, but yeah, like no one's perfect. And so much of technology in general, particularly because technology is a bit like a Jenga tower. We all build on what came before. Right. So, you know, I use unity and unity uses c sharp i use c sharp as well and that's built on top of net and then that's built on top of another layer. and there's all these layers of abstraction that actually if there's something imperfect down the pile or in terms of xr we take all these bits and kind of fit them together if something's imperfect in any of those there might be some kind of dependency clash or some right. kind of imperfection you can't even necessarily fix that yourself really so you find a workaround it's imperfect right. you you know you kind of make do and actually i think that's really fine particularly as an indie developer yeah. like it's really fine um once you get to a company there's kind of qa and levels <laughs> to avoid certain things but again nothing's perfect yeah i think optimization prematurely is probably a big reason why a lot of people don't mm. finish their projects because they mm. they'll, they'll build 10 things and they'll go back to the first one and be like oh that's not good enough i need to refactor it mm. make it but they never actually just you know finish and ship the thing because yes they optimize stuff they don't need to optimize quite yet mm, or they make functions definitely. that are so perfectly universal that and they use them like win one spot when they could have just pasted the mm. code there you know? yes give yourself permission to kind of i i often say like 
the first solution, I'm going to use a dumb solution. I use the yeah, dumbest possible solution. Like I'm just going to brute forcing. It's really stupid, but I'm, it's just going to it's just going to do for now. And then once I've done that, I'll come back to it and say, okay, that wasn't great. Like, what can I do better? But I'm not going to overthink and kind of spin my wheels forever on this thing because I'll never move on. So right. just sometimes a dumb solution is especially okay for now. Like the first draft of your novel is not going to be your final draft. Your dumb solution it doesn't have to be your final solution, but maybe right. it will be. That's also okay. And there are definitely times where like you it makes a lot of sense to come back and refactor stuff and make it better. Mm. But a lot of the times uh, you, when you think you'll need it, you, you don't end up needing it. Mm. Right? Like that solution was good enough and you're mm. on to bigger and better things. Mm. Yeah. So just for uh, anyone who's watching live at the moment, if you've got any questions for uh, Antonia or for Tim and I, probably more for Antonia. She's more interesting than <laughs> us. If you've got any questions, just put QST in at the start of your question so we can spot it. Uh, there's a question from Area 50. Tim, what was the game conference that was in VR? I don't remember. Let me Google it. <laughs> Speaking See? of... Well, we do. It's Google <laughs> stuff. Exactly. <laughs> it's really yeah, true. if you've got any really, really difficult questions, just ask Tim. I'll Google ask them for you. Now's the time. <laughs> really technical questions. Get a Rick. Like... No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because, you know, I say that as a joke, but... I often tell people I'm not a technical person and my title has senior technical specialist in it. But I don't, yeah. th I honestly, I have very little working memory. If you ask me anything off the top of my head, I'll have to Google it. Um, but I don't think of myself as a technical person and that's okay too. I can still do ostensibly a very technical role um, because you don't need to be some kind of maths or physics genius. The first thing I learned about coding that was a huge misunderstanding for me was that it, I think I saw maybe the brackets and the equal signs and I thought it would be like maths or physics. And I found that really disheartening. But for anyone who's listening who hasn't done any coding yet, uh, it's a lot more like learning Spanish. It's the language. And mm. uh, once you learn that equals means is and brackets mean, right. you know, what, what do I need? I started thinking of it as little people saying, what do I need to take and what am I putting out and who am I giving this to? And suddenly it was a lot less intimidating. Yeah. I think language yeah. is a really, really good uh, way to explain. I mean, we call them programming languages, but like mm. in, in game design, even aesthetics has a language, right? With the colors you mm. pick and the palette, there's a lot of like languages. And if you think of everything that you kind of build in terms of that language, I think it helps you be a little bit more consistent and understand the specifics of what's going in um, in different spots, especially for game design. Like I just designed a card game and like we're finding that like um, when I say like, on unit death for example that means a very specific thing in a specific context and so i can't have this other unit say when this unit dies because it it can be confusing because like wait mm. is that the same thing as on unit death you know what i mean mm. so it's like a very consistent design language rick what happened to your face <laughs> oh <laughs> i was wondering that but i didn't <laughs> want to say anything <laughs> What did happen I'll just to my face? Call him out. I don't know. Not, <laughs> not the first. Not the first time someone's asked me that. Tim. <laughs> What's going on here? Oh, hang on. Do we need to turn back on the echo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rick, you can only have good video or audio, not both. Apparently. Okay. Wow. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting look. It's a filter. It's a shader. I've been doing some shader research. <laughs> that is out of control. Is that my camera? Is that Skype? Looks good to me now. Anyway, yeah. Wow. That's, I don't know. Nice shade. I look like a superhero. Oh, there we go. No, I didn't fix it. I'd fix it. I didn't fix it. Anyway, so I kind of a superhero. It. So we, we have some questions. Well, I'll ask a question, then I'll see if I can figure out what on earth is going on with <laughs> maybe the sun's come out. Real quick, um, um, the the conference name was Indie World Order Con 2021, and it was in Unreal, and I posted a link to it in the chat, if anybody's wondering. Yep. Thank you. Um, there's been a question a couple of times. Uh, what uh, you, you might not know this if you're not in the boardroom, but what are Unity's plans for Africa? And I'm assuming it's more than like solving the problems in Africa. I assume it's to roll out Unity to Africa. I, I, I have no knowledge of where the question's coming from, but that's been a question for you. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't really have any insight into that, I will say. Um, I did work with um, Immerse Africa. So I have done some uh, kind of African XR events. And it's amazing seeing the development there because XR has this real potential to bring in a lot of um, like economy, a lot of investment, a lot of innovation. Um, and that's something that the African XR developers that I've been speaking to, you know, really um, kind of want to use it almost, I guess, as ambassadors to really help communities and to help kind of... Uh, 
stimulate the economy in in you know their their various cities. So yeah, I I don't really have any insight on the Unity side, unfortunately. Um, but there's some amazing XR work going on. Um, so I think XR Africa, Immersive Tech Africa, um, mm -hmm. are some of the amazing organizations that I've kind of done work with. Cool. And another question. This one's from Jimmy Chap. Uh, if I want to develop my own, uh, if I want to de develop on my own, are there grants for Unity to get me started for educational games, mm -hmm. etc.? So, does Unity do that? Developer grants, developer support. Um, you know, send out what was it? Some stickers to give people like that. Keep it up. Don't give up. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that so there are yeah the, the the grants I know of. There's a Unity for Humanity program. And that grant, I think, opens in uh, autumn because it's, uh, I think, just, yeah, just gone. The I think the finalists were chosen recently for last year. So every autumn, Unity has this Unity for Humanity grant. And if you're doing something that basically makes the world a better place in any way. So we've had environmental things. We've had um, cultural, kind of artistic-based things, things that are focused on education, um, things that focus on improving kind of awareness of different issues faced by marginalized groups. So LGBTQ, BIPOC, uh, people with disabilities, neurodivergent, um, people working in in dangerous industries. Uh, you might be doing some kind of training. There's a huge range. So I would look up the Unity for Humanity program if you're doing something that has that kind of positive social or environmental impact focus. Um, that's the one I know of. I'm not sure if there are others, actually. Um, I'm sure a quick Google will reveal all. Um, there might be other funds, but that one I'm I'm definitely aware of. Google is like the the star of this conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's what I do. Is just <laughs> Google stuff all day. It's true. Um, Lottie asks, how do you go about expanding your coding knowledge? Would you recommend a non-game related coding course, even if formatting conventions end up being different? Hmm. It depends what you're trying to achieve, I'd say, and it also depends on uh, your passion, your interest, and your your kind of history. So. I don't work in gaming at all now, but I did start with a course that was focused on games. And actually, I don't think that it being focused on games meant that it was in any way less relevant. Yeah. Because the things you do that become a still game... very use... relevant, Antonio. Still probably Extremely, the best course you could have yeah. taken to get you started of all <laughs> courses in the history of I mean, it clearly time. worked, Rick. So, you know, it was pretty It was pretty good. There were a lot of Rick dad jokes in it. So that was excellent. That kept me exactly. going during yeah. the challenging part. Use those in the interview. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't, I can't vouch Not. for that. <laughs> <Not>. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would say that even though the things I built were games, they were very directly relevant to things that would happen outside yeah. of games, for example, in industry, because it's almost the same thing. You know, you want to instantiate some kind of object. You want to right. press a button and have some kind of reaction in this part of the script over here. Uh, you want to make something more you know, make it look really great or make it more efficient. They're all kind of the same patterns. The only difference is, I guess, you don't get a kind of high score. But actually, the things you learn on a gaming-focused course would still stand you in really good stead for a less gaming-focused yeah. uh, thing. What I, what I would say is think about the kind of, either the kind of role you'd like to do or um, the kind of end goal and the best language for that. So as I mentioned yes. earlier, Python is the kind of language you would turn to for things like data manipulation or machine learning, whereas Unity and C-sharp really great for making visual content. So yep. Unity worked fantastically well for me because when I tried to learn C-sharp by itself, it was code in, code out, and I couldn't really pause or understand what I was doing or seeing. As soon as it was a cube and changing the code made the cube move, I was like, right, this makes perfect sense. So for my learning style, that was the best suited thing. And for what I wanted to achieve, which was creating visual content for a dome or for a headset, that was the best possible thing for me. So think about what it is you'd like to do and the sort of language or infrastructure you might want to use and maybe direct yourself in that way rather than saying it has to be a gaming or non-gaming course, which isn't, you know, it doesn't matter too much because you'll kind of build, use the same patterns either way. Yeah. Cool. I hope that helped. Rick makes dad jokes. <laughs> yes, avocado fire. Rick makes dad jokes. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Who would have Sometimes. known that? It's all part of being a dad. You should see my kids. They <laughs> hate it. <laughs> You've got it. It was great on the course, though. There's some levity, you know, and you're learning stuff like, you know, that, I mean, that course really helped me because it was, it just started out from, you know, this is how you make a cube. Like, great. I have no idea. This is how you actually, I think step one was, this is how you install Unity. And that's what I needed at that time yeah. because I was so confused because I'd never used a program where there were many versions of, you know, I didn't understand that the hub was one thing 
and that unity was a different thing and there were many versions of unity and they varied i'd never used because i I hadn't used blender or maya or or, you know autodesk or anything like that so i had no Mm -hmm. idea that that kind of software even existed so how to install it was really an obstacle for me so i was so grateful that that was the level that started that and you know that was that's what i was saying earlier about the difference between kind of like youtube videos and courses like youtube videos would be like how to get started in game development but they'll be like okay so open unity and add a component and you're like wait what what's going on yeah so the the sort of content as well that frustrates me nowadays and we see so much of is you know a little bit of a clickbaity title you know how to succeed using unity like this sounds great i'm i'm excited and it'll be an article or a video it's like here's the top seven things first one is have a good attitude second one is own a computer third one is get (laughs) unity you're like uh none of this how it's so surface mm. but it's ranking so high and yeah. it's you know mm. millions of views and for me are people looking at that and saying oh i didn't even think that i should learn c sharp like i, I mm. i'm i'm confused about this is one of the things of what actually makes sense for me as a student versus as a content creator and i think even when we have these conversations you know a little bit of clowning around but trying to get what can people actually go and use how can they mm learn from you to now go and do something better make better decisions and Mm. there's so much content out there that doesn't seem to have that ultimate goal of how do you get to where you're trying to get to so Mm. it's cool having you on to see that you've you've you're talking about you know i had this kind of goal and then i landed here and now i'm doing the thing so from a uh, a motivational point of view if anyone's out there saying i don't know if i've got the skills or the, or the time, or in my, mm. in my country, I can't do it, or, mm. uh, you know, maybe I, I come from the wrong background or whatever it might be. I think that a lot of this conversation is saying you, everyone can do it. You just apply yeah. yourself, be excited about it and passionate about it and go find the opportunity. So, you know, I, uh, I wish there was more of that. Tim and I try to do a lot of that. You know, it's really difficult, but mm. just yeah. get yourself out there and, and fight for what you are interested in in life and you can get there. I would also say for me, like the biggest obstacle was an emotional one. It was, I was doing YouTube video after YouTube video. I tried some other kind of courses and they just didn't come in at the right level. And I thought, well, I can't even install this software. Like what chance right. do I have? I'm just an idiot. Like yeah. I'm not meant to do this. I'm, I'm not a coder. Coding is for people who are really smart and you know, I can't even install the software. And I had this massive, massive imposter syndrome. And I've since learned that every software developer has imposter syndrome because yeah. you're constantly facing what you don't know. I'm constantly in rooms where all these words are being thrown around and I don't come from the same background. I don't speak the language. So I don't know what. So in my first dev job, I had a notebook and I looked like I was taking loads and loads of notes, but I was just writing down all the words I didn't know. And after work, I went home and I Googled every single one. And then I would open my notebook the next day. And when people said it, I'd say, oh, I remember this one from yesterday. And it turned out that there were three kinds of jargon. There was technical jargon, which I could Google. There was company specific jargon, which Mm -hmm. I couldn't Google. So that was really difficult. It was the stuff that never got answered. And, uh, you know, I had to ask someone eventually. And then there was corporate jargon. So people saying like, oh, we don't have the bandwidth. And I was like, that's so strange. They're a tech company. They really should have paid for more bandwidth. Like, Yeah, really just weird. get another internet <laughs> and, connection. What's wrong with you? And I was like, like, oh, it's, it's cool. But I didn't come from the corporate world. So I had really all of these obstacles where I just thought, well, I'm, you know, I was convinced I was going to be fired. I was so sure that I'd gotten the job by mistake. And yep. to the point where when I Googled stuff, I would hold control on my keyboard and scroll out on the mouse wheel so the text was really small so nobody could see what I was Googling. I'd have to squint really hard because uh-huh. I was so worried. People would look over my shoulder and go, you don't know that? God, like, what are you doing here? What an idiot. Get out of here. Um, and now I'm, you know, I, I don't struggle as much with imposter syndrome because I realize this is a normal feeling. But mm-hmm. don't let that, don't confuse that feeling for a fact. Right. Even if you try a course and it doesn't work out for you that's fine maybe that course isn't for you maybe that's aiming at people who are a different level to you that's fine that doesn't mean you're not good at it it just means they're yeah. assuming that you're further along your journey that's all right you know you don't have unity installed yet that's fine too find a course that teaches you to do that you're not in the wrong for not knowing something right. no one you know no one knows everything and most of us don't yeah. we, we google stuff all day long so it's yeah in, that, it, that obstacle was the biggest it's interesting i think also for people who maybe haven't spent a lot of time in in corporate world or as a as a team member that there's that kind of uncertainty at all levels we assume it's just the the person mm-hmm. who's new and just joined the team but you get that the higher up the chain you go you get people who are in a management position saying like wow i'm getting paid a lot of money and i need people to think that i'm really smart and really capable because I don't want to lose my job. So here's this new programmer who knows a lot of stuff. If they know more than me, oh my goodness, that jeopardizes my position. So I think there's a lot of the 
the posturing and a lot of the I need to take credit for this because I need to protect myself. And there's a, right. a it's very difficult. It takes a lot of confidence. But if you can be the person who helps the person more senior than you to be comfortable and not mm. feel threatened by you or not feel um, like yeah. they're the ones who are having to to put on a, a brave face, then you can I think you can work with people a lot more cohesively because they're mm. comfortable around you and they let their guard down. You can let your guard down. Yeah. But we assume it's only us. But everyone, yeah. like you say, everyone is there saying, I hope no one looks too closely because mm. Ugh. and then you get people at the other end of the spectrum like, OK, I'm just going to tell you how wonderful I am all day long. <laughs> so that I make myself feel better. Right. It's like, oh, I'm good at this and I'm good at that. And oh, you, you, you never know. So that's, that's why I'm such a big advocate for plain language. I mean, I've spent 10 years as a science communicator. So I really believe if you can't explain your subject to, you know, an uninitiated person, maybe a child, you probably don't know your subject well enough. Right. If you, yeah. the more plainly you can explain something to me, the more clearly you understand it yourself. And so I approach everything as a plain language conversation. And yeah, that changes cool. when I'm a dev speaking to another dev and it helps to use technical language. But I won't assume people know things. And if someone asks me to explain something, I don't consider that a failure of them. I consider it my failure to not explain it adequately. And I say, oh, I didn't realize I was using that language. It's quite exclusionary. My apologies. So right. I will always be the one asking that question. Like, what does this mean? Yeah. What does that mean? I don't think. And sometimes I'll say, I know what that means, but just for the room, can we just right, clarify yes. what that means? And then other people say, thank you for doing that. You know, I didn't understand, so I really appreciate it. And you'd be surprised how many people it's not clear to. Yeah, so. that's the philosophy yeah. we've kind of picked up as a teacher too, because it's super important. Mm. A lot of people are, are scared to ask the questions, yes. or, especially in a classroom setting, right? Like nobody wants to be like, in front of 30 people, like, what does mm. that mean? But like, mm. if you if you know that and you understand that from the perspective, you can kind of define the terms as you go, especially it makes extra sense for like YouTube content creation and stuff like that too, because you have no idea of the skill level of someone coming into the yeah. conversation. Right. So that's why immediately we're like, what's XR? Like, what is this? Yeah. AR yeah. VR? And yeah. Of like course. all that stuff. It helps. It's just, it's anytime you learn a new subject, it's overwhelming how much stuff you have to learn. And then if and you I have think... imposter syndrome on top of that, it's even scarier. Right. Yes. And it, it disproportionately affects people who are marginalized again. So I'm very, very aware, like I'm LGBT, I'm a woman in tech, which is unfortunately a minority, and I'm neurodivergent as well. And anyone who is different in any way or doesn't see themselves represented, if someone's a different ethnicity, a different age, has a different educational, cultural, or economic background, um, it mm. just feels out of place in any way, whether they are out of place or not. Right. Um, if they don't feel represented, they're going to be less likely to ask questions. They're going to feel more threatened. They're going to have more imposter syndrome. Right. So I really think it's a, a very urgent issue to make sure that our language is inclusive and accessible yeah. for everybody. And I really strive for that in my own content. But that's one thing I think is great about courses is that you can assume zero knowledge at the beginning right. and then take people through this journey because it's difficult as a content creator to always start with that because you don't right. want every youtube video to say okay install unity because it would just be ridiculous you know like we can't you know we have to explain every term in every video it does get challenging so yeah. i tend to kind of pitch towards a certain kind of demographic and that might be okay i'm assuming you're an intermediate unity developer but if not like that's fine that's no negative yeah, reflection yeah. on you this is just not the right video for you but one of my other videos maybe or a different video maybe but i think a course for me was a really great starting point because of that kind of longer journey yeah, yeah. it can so, get you from zero to one and then you can figure out where to go from there at least yeah yeah, yeah. sure a couple other technical unity questions that are popping up and i understand <laughs> that your your area of expertise is uh you know is xr so some of these might be outside of what xr sure. is touching uh, but can you talk a little bit about dots i know unity has uh done some recent dots update that broke our dots course so thank you yeah. unity um so you might be like i haven't touched dots not a problem dots, dots was like three years ago like oh my god dot, as in the data oriented tech stack there we yes, go Thank you. So, yeah, I've, I've, I have touched dots. So yeah, dots is the, I was about to say dots is the data oriented tech stack. It's a very different paradigm. Um, beyond touching it, I haven't done much with it to be totally honest. I actually sure. wasn't aware an update had just come out to it. I very rarely use it personally. Um, maybe I should, but no, yeah. I think <laughs> it's not quite that. Well, I mean, it was whatever, three years ago, I was like data oriented tech stack dots mm. and the job system and mm. ease, uh, entity component system, ECS. Yeah. Um, 
basically it's a different paradigm for constructing yes. your code so it's yeah it's we don't need to go in the depth of it but basically like this is going to change everything and we're even internally talking about oh my goodness all our courses are going to have to be recreated um instead of using object oriented is our approach we have to use data oriented <laughs> And then people are like, oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I'm a little mm -hmm. less interested, a little less interested. And then now it's kind of like, phew, kind of glad that didn't become a thing because we don't all have to go and learn a totally different paradigm for programming. But it's still kind of floating around a little bit. So yeah, if you're a, saying that around. you don't really do much with it, then okay, I don't, clearly yeah. internally Unity hasn't said, okay, everyone has to be you know switched to this system or else. Or maybe they have, and you just didn't read that memo, and you're like, oh. <laughs> I've just missed the email. It's in my unread. No, I. So we all really vary across. In, I mean, it's a big August, five thousand people. So we all really vary in what we do. And you know, dots maybe the. I mean, certainly dots has amazing advantages for things like optimization. But yeah. for what I'm doing, optimization really isn't the struggle right now. The struggle is kind of, you know, hardware, software creating yeah. content, um, using things together is one of the big challenges. So uh, I use a huge range of products and like using them together and figuring out where that's possible, and where that's not possible and what works and what doesn't is is one of the yeah. challenges I face. Um, so yeah, I would say it's certainly not mandatory for everybody. That's definitely not the case. Um, but there's gonna be use cases where it, it's that power is is really great and really yeah. necessary and what you need. And, and in my area, that's not really the priority if you, right now. If you need a million game objects, cruising exactly. around on your screen then use dots but if you exactly. don't then don't worry about it yeah and that exactly. would be kind of crazy to do in like an ar thing anyway like you know <laughs> or uh you know or i mean you could but yeah it's yeah. not a most well, and also especially what i find with industry and ar vr is um a lot of people are very new to it at all so even understanding what ar and vr are and that they can be used for industrial application that's the level yeah. that a lot of um kind of industrial uh, organizations are at just understanding what is this and, and who are Unity and what do we do? Because a lot of people haven't heard of Unity or they think, okay, Unity is just for games. There's no yeah. kind of understanding that actually you can use the same engine and do anything. It doesn't have to be a game. Um, but there's that kind of narrow kind of sh uh, yeah, pigeonholing of, oh, if it's a game engine, why would I use it? What can I possibly do with it? So that's a, a different kind of struggle. So that's more more my focus. Uh, is I've got another another similar tech question. This wasn't in the, in the chat, but this is from me. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. Now it's going to be a, it's going to be a proper one. It's not how to one make draggy dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you were to make a dog move around looking <laughs> I'm like I'm going to do it now <laughs> while we're talking, I'm going to build it. The question is, well, cause I think in, in XR, particularly in VR, there's going to be, I'm hanging out with that person and we're having a, a you know, a communication or a conference mm. or doing something together. So I imagine multiplayer is something that does have a little bit more relevance. Mm. Once again, What's going on with Unity multiplayer that has sort of nearly maybe been on its way doing stuff for a while? Um, do you have any any kind of insider hot tips, latest, you know, internal don't tell anyone this is off the record kind of stuff that you can share with us that our Rick's community will think we're <laughs> remain, or, or maybe just pretend well. that it's pretend that it's confidential <laughs> just so we all think it's special. Um. Yeah, if I was going to say, if I did, I'm not here in that capacity, so I would not be able to share anything off the record, unfortunately. Um, Unity multiplayer is in development. Um, so Unit is currently deprecated. Um, I think beyond that, actually, unfortunately, I can't really speak to it. There's like oh, a lot. Oh, of... yeah, reading between the lines, there's a lot <laughs> Don't read going between on. The lines. And some big <laughs> updates are coming soon. Like, if you can't talk. There's, I'm legally when saying, liable like, when you dots, say things like that, Rick. I could lose my with, job, like, honestly. With dots, you're like, there's nothing happening, don't use <laughs> it. But with no, multiplayer, you're that. like, I can't talk about that. I can't talk wink, about any wink, of this. Wink, wink, wink. Okay, my so legal everyone... team, I'm going to get sued by Unity. With the legal team, we're going to have a field day with this. You like... won't get sued. <laughs> Now watch the replay and be like, she said nothing, and that other <laughs> clown just went on and on about stuff. So you're fine. Yeah, I think you're fine. Right. Thanks, I don't really. think there's any legal boundaries you've crossed. But, no. but reading between the lines, there's going to be some big stuff happening soon. I've Very important. It's going to change the face of multiplayer development. So oh, you guys no. heard it here first. <laughs> no comment. No comment. Okay, very good. Carlos nice. oh. wants to know, can the artistic side of game development be learned? Or as an engineer, do I basically need to collaborate with somebody? That depends what you mean, I guess. Um, I think everything can be learned. Um, but yeah, there it is a very different skill set. So things like, I mean, again, it depends on what type of artist. So do you mean a UI 
artist? Do you mean a 2D artist? Do you mean a 3D artist? Or do you mean a technical artist where they might do VFX graph, shader graph? Um, they're all really different skill sets. I can't do any of them. So when I mock up UI, it's all blank boxes and sprites. It's very ugly. And then a UI artist comes in, does amazing iconography, does amazing, you know, on-screen UI design because I don't know where the buttons should go or what looks good. I just know how to make them work. Um, then your technical artist will, you know, make beautiful shaders. Again, not a skill I have or, or sculpt something in Blender. Yeah. Um, you can learn all those skill sets, but they are, you know, different levels of challenging and to do all of them would be a lot because each of those is a is a career in and of itself. You know, a, a Blender or Cinema 4D artist might do just that as their career. A technical artist who makes uh, rigs, who rigs models, they might do just like one of those things or a shader artist usually a shader artist will do other things as well um but yeah technical artist will be just that so it depends if you're making a an indie game you can absolutely use assets that already exist or make right. your own you can absolutely learn to i do actually sculpt things in blender um i haven't quite got the hang of rig rigging yet that's a quite an intense thing to learn um so i actually work with artists to do that but yeah if you're doing it on the level of you one person indie game and, you know, you just want to mock something up, absolutely, go for it, do it yourself. If you're working in a professional capacity and you want really swish UI, really great iconography, amazing shaders, amazing VFX, I would probably get someone in rather than try and do all that yourself because it's quite a lot. I always looked at it too as kind of like a difference between design and development. Like when people come into mm. video game development, they think all of that is one thing, right? The design, the mm. development, the art, but it's actually a lot of different professions, like you're saying. And I do yeah. think development is easier to learn than design is because it's mm. it's so much more subjective in a way um mm. there's a lot of good design practices and stuff like that but when it comes to like color palettes or picking colors for example mm. like so many artists will tell you oh well it's just i picked them because they look good but yeah but how do you find yeah. out what looks good man like what's mm. the technical process to <laughs> to figure that's out my thinking the, yeah right what's the uh, algorithm what exactly are you using? Yeah. So it's it does I think a lot of that is based on intuition and intuition is based on mm -hmm. kind of experience, right? And so it design seems to be a little bit harder and kind of uh stuff that kind of matures over time working with stuff. Whereas development, go here, do this, click this, type this is is a lot uh clearer and more simpler to learn, I think, in the beginning. So yeah. as an engineer, you might have a little bit of trouble with design stuff, I would say. Uh yeah. in the beginning. Cool. So it so comes naturally if we, sometimes some people. <laughs> depends on the person, yeah. Yeah. Right, we fit out 90 minutes, so we should probably wrap up. Uh, I'm not seeing any uh, uh, from Peter Morgan. Uh, where can we follow you on social media? That's a good question. Great question. Thank you. So um, Twitter is where I'm most active. If you're on Twitter, I'm Antonia R. Forster on Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm Antonia Forster on LinkedIn. Um, Instagram. I'm Antonia Forster on Instagram. Uh, if you Google my name, I'm the whole first three pages. So I'm really easy to find. Wow. Nice. <laughs> I've got a lot of SEO. So um, yeah, add me on wherever and yeah, stay in touch. But I'm, I'm most active, I'd say on Twitter and LinkedIn, although I've been asked to make a TikTok for a really long time. So I might do that at some point. <laughs> yep. TikTok and is interesting. The, the, mm. the last, last main question I've got is, uh, if, if you were to hop in the time machine and go back to your younger self when you were starting mm. out in this direction of your career, what, what advice would you have really wanted to have known back then? And what advice would you have actually listened to and done? <laughs> so, Great question. Um, yeah, my advice would be that the hardest part of coding is that feeling that you're not meant to be there. If you do a YouTube tutorial and it doesn't work, it might be that that teacher doesn't suit you or isn't good. It might be the content's wrong. It might be the content's out of date, or it might be that the content's not aimed at you specifically, and that's okay. None of those mean that you should stop. So honestly, try five or six or seven different tutorials before you say maybe you know don't change the approach and try something else. Um, you know, be persistent. Don't feel that you don't belong. And if you do feel that way, realize that feeling is not a fact. We are all learning. We're all flawed. We all Google stuff a lot. Um, take a course and, and don't feel that your imposter syndrome means you're not meant to be there. It's just lying to you. Um, the advice I actually would have taken is that's easier said than done. But getting into tech has been probably the best thing I've ever done for my quality of life. Um, it's really allowed me to have a lot more stability, a lot more security. Um, the job security is amazing. I can work remotely. 
I can support my family and my community. And it's just, it's been really incredible to go from an industry where there are more people than jobs to go to another one where there are more jobs than people. The mm. power dynamic is totally flipped. Suddenly people yeah. are in, invested in you and interested in you because they know that you're a rare commodity versus, you know, I was really passionate about what I did before, but I was constantly exploited and I knew that I was dispensable essentially. So yeah, for me, it's been incredible. And that's the advice I would actually take is even though it may not seem as glamorous, it's actually amazing and you're going to have a, a great quality of life. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. That's I, I think the more we tell everyone you can do it and it's worth it and it's great, I think the more people will listen and actually b believe what we're saying. So, you know, you are living proof that you can switch careers. You can say, this is what I want to do. You can find yourself a, a great uh, a great role that really suits who you are. So yeah, that's very inspirational. And, and also, um, I just want to say, I I am a super fan of your communication style. It's very direct. It's very honest. It's very open. It's very authentic. And it's super you. awesome to talk to somebody like that because there's so many intricacies in the corporate world and in game design, mm. and game dev. And then you throw in human things like ego and all this other stuff. Mm. And people maybe leave out stuff or don't say stuff. And, and there's a lot of people out there that could learn from that stuff and i really appreciate you just sharing all this authentically it's it's really really cool to have someone like thank you, on you. Board. thanks a lot i really appreciate it please do stay in touch um as i said i i have i have actually really loads of exciting updates about my work coming up really soon so uh yeah stay in touch especially Multiplier. twitter linkedin it, no, it's not about <laughs> unity it's actually about what i do outside of unity it's about Perfect. um my museum work there That's um exciting. different innovations i'm i'm personally working on so yeah, yeah like keep, nice. awesome. keep an eye out for that yeah awesome. thank you for having me i really appreciate it yeah thanks Twitter thanks for joining us today it's a pleasure and thank you to everyone in the chat who's asked great questions and mentioned draggy dog uh i think someone in chat was saying if you haven't he clicked the like button can you please click the like button if you've liked today if you haven't liked today then don't click it that you should be, be able to click the now. dislike it, button but now you just gotta click the like button yeah Sorry. just like it it's kind of I'm, I'm okay with it going <laughs> away it took a while but anyway it's just just the positive just the good vibes so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Antonia, for giving your time generously to our community. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll get you to, to come back and talk to folks again really soon. So thank you very much for your time I today. I hope so. Thanks Good night, a lot. everybody.